So here we are. I'm here with uh, Ben. We're in, well, Ben Guest. We're in Gresham House's headquarters. Your new headquarters, actually. Mm -hmm. You've been here for a year or so, isn't that? Not even. Uh, about six months. And um, we are here. Thanks for coming on, because I know Thank your you time very is very... Uh, yeah. Lots of people want it. And um, we are so pleased to have, it, have you on the podcast to talk about um, everything to do with batteries and Gresham House's journey and uh, what next, really. Brilliant. So, um, Ben Guest. How is, how, how is Ben Guest here as the energy storage fund guy? Um, what happened before this? And um, yeah, who are you? Okay, question. Good, good question. Big question. Good question, Quentin. Um, <laughs> just giving you a full background so that um, people know. Uh, I've been in the fund management industry since 1994, um, graduated as an engineer, um, and then uh, joined uh, Lazard Asset Management. Um, at the time, it was called Lazard Investors, and it's a well-known uh, fund manager in the city. Actually, overall merchant bank, as, as it was called in those days. Um, less well-used term these days. And I uh, became a junior fund manager and junior analyst, um, focusing on all sorts of different areas. Um, but levered early on my knowledge of technology, being a um, you know, recently graduated engineer and someone who studied electronics at A level and various other things. Um, and uh, back in the asked, an analog days, back <laughs> early days of digital. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I, just, I was just throwing one out there, see whether you'd catch it. Yeah, early days of digital, early days of fiber, early days of semiconductor. Well, relatively early days of semiconductors and mm -hmm. sort of microprocessors and so on. So, um, and, and dare I say, mobile phones and other things mm -hmm. as well. Um, yeah. Emails were a new thing when I was working. Um, uh, so I, I, I started there and I let my trade in fund management and in, in what was in, in, in those days and even today, I think, known as a um, value investing um, outfit and learned an awful lot about that. I focused on areas like TMT, Tech Media Telecom, as they became uh, relevant areas towards the end of the 90s and uh, early noughties. And... Um, then um, tried my hand at um, hedge fund management and did that within Lazard and then within another company that um, uh, emerged uh, from people uh, who, who came from Lazard um, in uh, 2003 and did that for uh, three or four years. Before. So you ran your own fund? Uh, absolutely. Hedge fund. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I ran um, Europe's largest long short tech fund. Wow. Um, okay. It's a billion dollars. Um, at, at its peak, and then um, decided to wind all that up and pack it all in and set up my own business called Hazel Capital. For a low-stress life instead, for of course. A stroke, for a low-stress <laughs> life. Yeah, just before the financial crisis hit as well in okay. 2008, um, which was very low-stress, and um, found my way um, yeah. and decided to uh, make it an entirely green, if I can use the expression green or clean tech, popular expression in the day, um, focused uh, uh, company. Okay. Um, so sort of left all the knowledge I had behind other than obviously being able to use it in other ways um, within the new area. And then quickly realized that the most interesting area from an investability perspective and scalability perspective was, was infrastructure. It wasn't about the manufacturers. It wasn't about um, other parts of the value chain. I was most interested in the, in the um, infrastructure side and then eventually backfilled, if you want to call it that, um, in the development side. So initially thought, well, you know, um, fund fund managers, equity fund managers, whether long, short, or otherwise, um, think it's a good year if they've made anywhere, depending on their risk profile, five to twenty percent. And I was thinking, you can buy a solar farm, especially in this environment um, uh, in southern Europe, because the UK hadn't didn't have any yet. Um, no sunshine. But in two thousand, <laughs> no sunshine yet. In two thousand eight or nine, you could actually sort of buy solar farms with twenty percent IRRs. Um, and I was thinking, wow, you buy it, you look after it, but you don't have to sort of go and pick stocks every year, um, many, many times over, and make sure you get that right and manage your risk. It's interesting. It's there and it's there forever. And I was um, uh, very interested in that. And it was actually new to me as, as an investment area and um, learned the trade by trying and by doing um, and uh, learned all about the, the underlying technologies and the O&M and... Uh, the challenges from a legal perspective and due diligence and everything else, and basically, you know, cut my teeth um, buying um, initially a distressed solar farm in in uh, in Spain, um, and then went from there. And then when the market emerged in in 2010 uh, for feed-in tariff um, subsidised solar projects, uh, we 
got heavily involved. It was launched go time. It, it, we went for it and uh, raised a couple of VCTs. Um, this is all Hazel Capital. This is all Hazel Capital, and um, you know, built uh, four of the um, first circa sort of five megawatt um, solar projects under the initial feed-in tariff um, regime, uh, which came to an abrupt end. Um, because of the realization that uh, the UK might be making a similar mistake to what the Spanish made in terms of um, allowing too many megawatts getting built under a very generous subsidy scheme. Um, so that was cut short, but um, so there was a hiatus immediately after that. I don't know if you remember that. Um, and then, but we went from there and developed and or managed um, about 300 megawatts um, in the first few years of Hazel Capital. And, and then when the subsidies came to an end and at the similar time, uh, the ability to invest through tax-efficient schemes into renewables also came to an end. Uh, we we um, started to pivot into um, new areas and looked at very many areas. In, um, but but um, one of the areas that really took hold in around 2015 was was the batteries. Was mm-hmm. As long ago as 2015, um, and um, built um, initial projects with contracts in FFR, so commercial FFR as opposed to EFR, where we just saw everyone heading at that market and being overly um, basically competitive in the auction. So um, if you win at an auction, my rule of thumb is you've actually lost, not won. Um, So it's probably not a fair comparison every time, but um, it's it's an indicator that you've obviously paid the most. Well, yeah, Um, we saw projects, I think EDF went down to seven pounds for their projects, and we had FFR prices at like 15, 20 quid. (laughs) Uh, 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 Well, no, in those days, um, the FFR prices were in the 20s. Wow, yeah. And and, and our lowest price was, I think, about 18. I forget exactly. It's like everybody do the EFR thing, and Mm. really the the play was don't go there, look over here instead. Look over here. Now, of course, EFR was four years. Of course. FFR was was for two. It's still yeah. generous in those days um, for new projects, and uh, we built our first seventy megawatts, and that became the seed portfolio uh, for the Gresham House Energy Storage Fund. Um, and of course, while we're building those, um, I was having lots of conversations with Gresham House and um, coming inside uh, to to really sort of um, uh, continue this the story in energy storage and and go from there. So did so how did that work? So did um, Gresham House existed before Hazel? Did, did Hazel Capital get bought by Gresham House? Correct. And you changed the name to Gresham House too, or you no, no, started Gre- you? Gresham House acquired actually the business of Hazel mm-hmm. Capital, so it didn't buy the entity; it just bought the business yeah. um, of, of Hazel Capital, and and everyone that was within Hazel Capital also came over to, to Gresham House. Okay, so if I got this right, um, originally an engineer, um, mm-hmm. were you a ke- chemical engineer? Was no, that, no, were you mechanical, mechanical, but yeah. also did lots of electronic stuff as well. Yeah, then some, w- yeah. moved into investing. Um, hedge fund manager for, for a while that yeah. would have been crazy yeah. um, and then um, left all that behind and started a brand new thing getting into solar solar at Hazel Capital moved really really fast and then got into batteries Correct. pretty much 2015 which was early back then looking yeah, at far and other things. Yeah. okay um, and so so you've been doing this for a long time and you've been you've been doing batteries for a long time we'll talk about batteries specifically mm. um, and this is a bit of a it's almost a silly question because it's so big but what what have been the big learnings along the way? I mean, we've, what do you say that the market is mature now? Is this a mature technology? Is this a mature in investment class? Are we there yet? Um, and um, along the way, how, what do we have to do to get there? So is it mature? In some ways, it's mature in that I think it's fully investable. You've got technologies that are available, that are reliable, um, that mean that you can put them in the ground. The, the business model is um, visible, clear, um, likely to keep developing favorably so i think that makes it very very investable and and therefore sufficiently mature as as a sector to to grow Um, in terms of maturity from a a where we will where will we end up versus where we are now i think we'll look at our earlier plants and you know in five or ten years time and go well they still work they're still generating good returns but it's isn't it funny how we used to do things that way or that way you know the easy examples are um the fact that our first batteries um, weren't containerized by the manufacturer of those battery cells, so um, it was done by the EPC contractor. So they did a very good job, but you know they are very much shipping containers that have been containerized, uh, that, that in, in which the batteries have been containerized. Well, now everything is, you know, made for purpose, of, yeah. uh, and and that's extracting cost. And and I think there'll be a, a cost curve, especially on the system side, that that will be pretty significant. Um, and so there'll be standardization, more standardization. But other areas where there's um, maturity 
you know, when we first got involved, the, the company, we were, one of the partners we were working with, actually wrote the control system, developed the APIs for the interfaces with the batteries for the first time. Uh, all of these are now you know, readily provided by the optimizers um, and or other companies that specifically provide what we could call a glue in, 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 in when, whenever whenever you have whenever you've got a missing piece um, yeah. and examples of that would be um, the fund that we funds that we subsequently raised were used to acquire some um, EFR projects those EFR projects were also dis- early projects commissioned in 2018 so some of those have got relatively rudimentary control systems you know layering on um, uh, software onto that um, provided by third parties um, you know that just speaks to the maturity the fact that that's even possible um, yeah. so yeah it's, it's definitely moving interfaces on, on interfaces there in, it is interfaces on interfaces so it's not it's, it, it works well um, it's, it's just more counterparties you have to deal with yeah. and what about the now actually let's put some numbers around it right because sure. um, some of the folks listening I hope, I'd imagine Gresham House doesn't really need much introduction but let's do it anyway so sure. how big is the portfolio now how big are we talking sure so the, the portfolio is 425 megawatts of operational assets We've got 415 megawatts of, of um, assets in construction. Um, we've got a portfolio that we've announced, um, which if you include the operational portfolio, the in construction portfolio, and the remainder of the pipeline, um, it totals 1.557 megawatts. Wow. The gigawatts, sorry. So you've got, um, as much as you've got built now, you've got under construction already. So space, Pretty much. things yeah. you know going in the ground. Yeah. And then on top of that, you've got another sort of 60, 70% as well. On top, my math isn't great. Yep. But you... Yeah, but, but almost the same again. So it's what's, just like, what, yeah. what's the end game? How big, how big does Gresham House go with this? That's a really good question. I mean, it depends what time horizon you take. Um, is there ever an end point for a company? Probably not. You know, mm-hmm. It's a continuum. Um, but if you were to sort of... Actually, if you ask me the question about Modo, yeah. I'd probably say I'd probably just Clear freak exit. out. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. There yeah. is no end, right? Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, exactly. What, what what what's sort of really clear is, and, and if you sort of take a global perspective, um, uh, or, or a very macro perspective, you realise that the energy market is colossal, which is why I got into this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sort of just to give you another little bit of background. You know, when I when I was in uh, TMT and in tech in particular, you know, my expertise was in understanding cost curves and in the development of industries and just how quickly they developed. You know, it sort of take decades for TVs to penetrate the entire population. It took a decade for mobile phones to penetrate the global population, pretty much. Um, so just how different it was. And then I thought, well, where is the next big um, ESCA from 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 a career perspective uh, that I can also add value in and. And um, what do I also care about, which is sort of the green agenda? And I was just amazed by how big the energy market is compared yeah. to the tech sector, for example. And if you think that the entire energy market was historically subdivided into oil consumption, gas consumption, electricity consumption, and all of that is now going to become electricity, um, and all of that is generated by renewables, and then it dawns on you that you need batteries sitting alongside all of those renewables, you realize that while the renewable sector is absolutely colossal, or will be, it's very big already, but it will be absolutely colossal. The the same the same goes for energy storage, and then you realise just how big a thing we have embarked on. And I was running some some numbers the other day. You know, in, in the US, the penetration of renewables is um, really under twenty percent if you think of wind and solar, and um, that will obviously go to a hundred percent. But then you're talking about overall electricity consumption probably going up. Three times. Yeah, it um, makes my brain hurt. I mean, the yes. ele- electrification of everything. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I believe, I know this is some people don't agree with this, but energy consumption is a key driver of um, general opportunity and bringing up you know, the whole world to a standard of living that is, that is necessary. I, I don't think we can do it without increasing in, um, consumption. So you've got those two things, electrification of everything plus mm-hmm. that, and you've got a market which is uh, most people would kill to be involved in. Um, well, they're welcome to join. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but I guess the, the, also part of the story is, so you guys have got a gigawatt, two gigawatts in a couple of years. You know, that's the kind of numbers we're talking about. Mm. But that might end up being a drop in the ocean yes. in 15, 20 years' time. Yes. So exactly. maybe maybe you have to go even faster and even bigger. I don't know. I don't know about faster. Um, certainly, we're growing fast enough. We're, yeah. we're, we're very busy. Um, but, but bigger, for sure. I mean, it's my view that um, being gigawatt scale will, will not make you a large player. 
um, in, in the electricity market longer term. Um, it'll be multi gigawatt, maybe deca gigawatt. You know, sort of that's that will be a player that is, you know, significant because if we can be a gigawatt plus in the UK, which represents about one percent of the global electricity market, it gives you an idea of just how big the global electricity market is. Yeah. Um, you know, and so it just happens to be that the UK has been forward thinking for a bunch of reasons, um, you know, off gem bays, national grid, the investor, investor set, everybody, it's, it's all, events have come together to, to, to result in a, you know, sort of early emerging um, battery sector. So um, I've got to ask you, so you're, um, you're the fund manager, right? You're the, yeah, um, right. So, so part, uh, my, excuse my ignorance, but yeah. part of your job as a fund, rate, uh, fund manager is fundraising, right? And so mm-hmm. if you've been doing this for a fairly long time, you would have seen how the narrative or the story has changed over time with um, raising capital and getting investors comfortable with these kind of assets. Mm-hmm. So I wonder whether you just comment on that. You know, where, where are we now and how far have we come? Um, and are investors now comfortable with this thing? Mm. That's, that seems so normal to us now because we're in it every day. But mm. to folk, there's lots of folks out there who um, still they hear about it for the first time and it sounds like space age stuff. So um, h- how does that work and what are you seeing? It's, it's a really good question. Um, first of all, our narrative in terms of what we tell investors has not changed. You know, we've, we've consistently talked to the, the thesis that this is all about the intermittency of renewables, that batteries enable a cost-effective transition by avoiding curtailment um, and the need to fill in troughs in supply um, it, with gas or something else. And therefore, it makes it cost effective from a CO2 budget perspective and a cost perspective, generally, mm-hmm. you're saving electricity. And, and that has been the mainstay for what we say. That is the reason you build these batteries. Everything else is ancillary, literally, um, and, um, and, and a nice business to be in if, if you can make money out of it and you know use your batteries more gently as we have over the last few years but the the that is our core thesis we of course there are lots of investors who are still becoming familiar with this and still have elementary questions which are completely fair around you know is there a risk of obsolescence um what's the risk around competition are you going to arbitrage your returns away um it, you know, and, and the answer to that is yes but it's going to take about three decades um and um and and you know not to zero um and um uh, other other questions around just what is the business model what what is trading you know how does it work how are power prices set um, um in, in some cases it's difficult to know what questions to ask if you don't know the electricity market yes. because it's so yeah. familiar to us but it's not an industry which lends itself to um outside in um learning um, because we almost have to know where to look. It's very hard to find decent primers and so on. It's getting probably better. Um, National Grid's getting increasingly transparent with, with useful web pages and the like, um, and you can learn from others as well. But it, it is it is a relatively challenging industry to get to know, and if you don't understand the principles of electricity on top of that, uh, or also the wholesale market mechanism, or the, how the networks are set up, it, it's it's probably a challenge. Um, if, you, if you come from a background of something tangential, whether it's infrastructure or something else, um, uh, you, you probably have a head start. But yeah, it, it's, it's, it's definitely challenging in that sense for um, our investor or prospective investor base. Um, but um, you know, one of the key messages we share is that, especially in, you know, one of the things that really challenge investors is um, the fact that it's a merchant business model. So the fact that we don't fully contract our revenues in a space where fully contracted revenues are attractive. And you can contract them. As, as you know, you can you can, certainly in terms of floor, floor, floor prices, um, but we don't see the value in that. And our investors um, haven't expected that of us at this stage. And that's interesting. interesting. Yeah. And, and equally interestingly is nor have our lenders. So right. we secured debt last year. And I had prior to that thought, well, maybe we have to start contracting some of our revenues <clears throat> in order to secure um, debt at attractive levels. Um, in terms of t- total quantum, but also cost of money. And, and that hasn't been the case. Um, they've wow. got comfortable with a sufficiently low and the levels we want it, um, you know, 25, 30% leverage, um, which increases returns, but we're securing, you know, three, three and a half percent money. Um, that is exciting because it means that the industry's moved on. 
That is so contrary to, I think, conventional thinking around this, which is mm. that the reason why you have a floor price is because institutional investors and debt need floor prices because otherwise they can't get comfortable because this thing's right. so new and blah, blah. That's right. And so what you're saying is that's not the case. Maybe that's because it's Maybe that's because it's Gresham House. Right? Maybe that's I think I think there's a case for that. Um, our, our debt facility is, is is what's called a capex facility, so we draw it down as new investments come through. Mm-hmm. It's not um, leveraging the existing portfolio, but the existing portfolio there has a strong cash flow, which can service the debt as it comes through. So it provides an extra protection for the lender. If you look at at, at the rates that we're talking about, they're certainly at a premium to what solar and wind projects um, get debt at, but um, given the higher returns. Um, the servicing of that debt is covered by, uh, or largely covered by, um, our CM contracts, for example. And so there's there's really strong um, coverage and and security there. So it, it, it's worked out very well that 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 there is good coverage at sensible levels of debt um, that haven't spooked investors. And the idea that we have a portfolio has obviously helped. Yeah, can I, can I ask you on that because um, so. I would have thought mm. that a floor price would be really attractive to you, Ben mm. Guest at Gresham House. And, um, I, and it sounds like from you speaking, it's, it, it's not, um, or the way that they're currently offered isn't. Is that because you have to pay a premium for them or because the numbers are too low and you are far more bullish on, on energy storage, as I am, than many of the floor prices offer? What, how are you thinking about it? Yeah, ultimately, it's um, what do you put in your financial model if you have a floor price? contract and, and and what do you put in your model if you've got a merchant contract and they're very different numbers so I'll go with the merchant contract thanks very much <laughs> um, and it is it is the confidence in understanding the market um, and that goes to one of the key messages we share with our shareholders which is this is a fundamentally profitable business model so when you use the word trading to people in the finance industry they might think you know short-term trading derivatives speculation yeah potential for loss on a daily basis. It's not that. It's not any of that. You are dealing with a positive spread that exists as a function of supply demand imbalances that nothing else can store yeah. or capture. Or capture. And so we capture those spreads. Um, our, our, our investors and, and lenders have all understood that. And therefore, it's about a positive return. And, and where that positive return lands, that's the uncertainty. But that's not such a bad thing. At least our investors have comf- got comfortable that it's not such a bad thing to have that variability, given that the starting point is substantially positive. And so, if you if you're looking at a, a, a starting return where, you know, even the lower end of a likely outcome is probably better than you get on a renewables project, you know, it's, it's not a bad investment. Yeah. Surely? Question mark. Um, it's like if you're an investor and you're going to invest in Gresham House or a fund or you know, you're, going to, you're going to buy battery assets or a bit of one, hmm. you kind of, you've got to wrap your head around the whole macro picture anyway. So you're going to have to get comfortable with how a merchant works and exactly as you say. Yeah. So if you're going to go to all the trouble of figuring out how that works hmm. and you're, you're in the asset class because you understand its need and the, all the stuff that we've, we've been talking about. Then why give away a bit of that to a floor price just to another counterparty who sort of agrees with you, but but not quite as much? <laughs> no, I, I, absolutely, you just read my mind. Absolutely, yeah. exactly that. Yeah. Okay, um, I want to talk about optimizers for a second because Gresham House, of course, you've got four hundred twenty-five megawatts now. You can have a lot more megawatts, mm-hmm. um, and so um, I think all of these assets are out at the moment, or most of them are with optimizers. Mm-hmm. And of course, that that will happen. In, you just signed a big deal with Arenco. Congratulations on that. Mm-hmm. Um, how how do you think about optimized in this space and you've used a lot of different ones right um mm-hmm. uh, some of which i've been on the end of in previous lives <laughs> so um how do you think about the, the, how optimizers have come on in the last few years and what you're excited about to do with optimizers and how do you choose one well that just just sort of going full circle that's another area where maturity um has sort of emerged um you know when we first got involved um we were Sort of in, interrogating, if that's the right word, or interviewing the the optimizers and and um, ensuring they that were they, tough interviews, by the way, <laughs> on the it? other side of the table. Oh, I see. <laughs> but, um. yeah, like, uh, go back a slide. What does that chart mean? Exactly. What does that chart well, mean? Well, we really well, yeah. wanted to understand how our optimizers made money because you know that's one of the big challenges with batteries is how does a battery get um, entered into the market, whether it's a BM balancing mechanism or, or wholesale market. And make money, given that it's got to um, choose when it when it 
makes it when it charges, which in, in effect means when it makes itself available in due course for export. And, mm. and that's so different to gas peakers and other dispatchable assets where it's just basically around the cost of the fuel. And if the power price is higher than the cost of fuel, you run it and you keep running it because there's no end of battery life. You just keep yeah. running it and you just keep it up. So those are the two big differences. It's sort of a variable short run marginal cost for a battery and it's a function of its import. Um, cost and uh, and the fact that you can only run it for a finite amount of time those are the two fundamental differences we make the equation for how you run these assets completely different so we got our heads around that but we just wanted to see who else could do this and fortunately there are a handful of companies quite extraordinarily really um emerging to to do exactly that that they literally made their entire business about that um you know habitat energy and arenco being two great examples uh, as well as um in-house uh, optimization teams at, at places like EDF um, and Flextricity. So, um, you know, they really understood the need to move away from, you know, um, human-based Excel sheet trading, you know. Um, and um, unfortunately, that was there, and, and therefore we could, um, uh, as our FFR contracts, initial FFR contracts on our seed assets rolled off, we could actually allocate capacity to these to these um, companies and, and they've been extremely impressive in, in, in how they've developed but what's mad is you guys have you've been around the whole market you've worked with most of the optimizers once mm -hmm. i think and you've you've learned all this stuff mm -hmm. and you're still now saying you know what we're not going to do this in-house so that must mean a you're getting a pretty good service from these optimizers or you're, you're comfortable now with work, with the work that they do and that they're worth it um, which actually I, my personal thought is i think the gate the optimizer the job of an optimizer has become so much more difficult. Hmm. Um, and it's been impressive how um, some in particular have really stepped up yeah. on, and not, not just performance, but also on reporting and yeah. all, the, all the other stuff that they have to do. But what's cool is you guys have been around the whole market. You must have considered we can do this in-house. We could build this in-house. And you're still saying, you know what? We're going to give this stuff to other people. Yeah. So how do you make that decision? Well, if you think about what makes up an optimizer, it's not what we have in-house. It's software engineers. It's people who understand the, the market and trading, you know, as, as, as well as they breathe, you know, it's really, really well. And people who can um, develop machine learning algorithms um, or other AI concepts to really make the decisions. And then they have to be able to um, create the IT infrastructure that can process incredible amounts of data and therefore understand the, the need for a highly, highly reliable and redundant IT system as well. These are, these are skills that we just don't have in-house. Um, yeah. We could absolutely bring them in-house and do that. Um, but as you get bigger, you get better terms on an optimization agreement and you get that as a function of your scale. You don't need to um, go through the, 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 the challenge of, of doing that yourself and making mistakes and or getting it right but there's that risk yeah and so why introduce that risk when there's a robust set of optimizers out there and a highly um, competitive market for them which yeah, is pushing them against each other you know, there's so yeah. much innovation in that space yeah yeah absolutely so you know even though they're all you know, especially the leaders are extremely smart that there is there is more than one of them so there yeah. is a degree of competition um so that's obviously benefit we benefit from that um so, you know, if you think about what we want to achieve, it's achieving scale and returns for our shareholders. Well, sorry, returns for our shareholders and is a function of scale and is a function of good fund management, which is a function of um, good capital discipline, good, in, in, in equity market terms, stock selection, selecting the right projects, designing them well, um, contracting well, negotiating well. Um, and, and that's our core, core skill set. And um, doing that more than um, trying our hand at optimization when it's not necessary. It's just not necessary. And when you, when you achieve scale through a simple focus strategy, um, that, that is, that is, that's how you come out with the decisions where you don't do anything. I'm just thinking as, as an infrastructure play like, mm. like, like, like this, like this game that you guys are in. Uh, I call it everything's a game, but... Um, the, I guess there's the, the the idea in the financial world that past performance doesn't indicate future performance or whatever that word is, that that, that mm -hmm. phrase that comes over on the radio and on the news, whenever this sure. happens, right? 
But I guess if you're an asset business, hmm. it kind of does, right? It, it has to because you've learned, because every time you build an asset, every time you run an asset, every moment that you're running an asset, you're learning, and it's about your learn rate in the startup parlance. It's a learn rate thing, which I'm sure you're. So um, it's just a funny one to think about, which is you know, although I guess all of that would be priced in. I'm just going around in my head. How does that sit? Anyway, I'm going going down a rabbit hole in my own mind here. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, consistency of performance um, speaks to investment process, um, and also, then, in, given that each of these projects is sort of operating business, the the, con- the sustainability of the operating environment will, will determine whether you know their own returns slip or commoditize or, or whatever. But I, I I'm very much taking the view that we need to be, you know, in, in inverted commas, um, paranoid. You know, assume that. Um, we might enter another COVID environment where electricity demand collapses and gas prices are, you know, sort of setting prices in the twenties. And we want to be this is this is my my own personal goal is to be able to hit our dividend even in that horrible environment. And um, and we're confident we're going to get there. That that is uh, that is that means that because having been a student of markets and companies and industries for so long, um, you realise that all industries eventually commoditize. Yeah. And um, doesn't mean that the leading company in that industry can't make good returns. We want to be that company. You just got to win. You so, be that company. what about? Um, well, let's that, that brings us on to consolidation. What are you thinking sure. about consolidation in this market? Mm. Um, because at the moment, it's wild how many new entrants there are. Assets, you know, there's, there's talk of uh, you know, various new funds. Start. They've got three big funds now. There's talk of new ones this year. Mm-hmm. We've got utilities buying assets, oil companies getting involved in assets. There's so much you know, real estate funds, property funds, supermarket funds. There's all sorts of folks in this place now. So what happens in the uh, next? Will there be consolidation or is there enough space for everybody? Um, I think we've been through one phase of consolidation, which is the um, sale by most of the EFR assets. And we bought 120 of, I think, the 200 meg that got awarded contracts in 2016 and got built in 2018. So we that was one phase of consolidation where we bought um, uh, assets from those exiting the sector and with, with and, and one other asset as well from, from a player exiting the sector. So that that, that is um, a first wave, I think, of people entering the market and going, yeah, not for us or whatever they decided. There's bound to be a second wave and so, or third wave, and to the extent that there are waves or whether it becomes continuous, you know, you sort of have people who build assets, choose to run them for a bit, whether they think they're going to get a better return as a result of doing something like that, and then sell them or just pivot into something else. Um, whatever the reasons are, there's bound to be consolidation. But I, I, at the moment, as you say, there's I'm not sure the right word is fragmentation, but there's certainly a lot of new entrants and a lot of um, uh, yeah, sort of new players, and and we'll see how how they all get on. There's there's a it's, lot of it's kind of comforting because it yeah. means there's loads of new players who are saying, this is the place to put my money. But then it's kind of uncomfortable too because then you, you, it, you can turn it on its head and say, um, if there's so much interest, then I'm glad I'm first or I'm big or whatever. But that mm-hmm. also makes me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> so um, Makes you feel uncomfortable. Well, I, mean, I don't know. Yeah. In a sense, yeah. I don't uh, own, mm-hmm. uh, own my house and that does well for me, but that's right. about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it doesn't make me feel uncomfortable but with so much... If you if if you have growth of interest in the sector forever to a point, there's too much growth of interest ah, in the sector. Yeah, sure. I guess I don't think we're there yet. It's just no. something I was thinking of. No, I think we're far from that. Um, and then I just got a couple more questions. So a bit of a silly question, really, but have you guys looked internationally? So most of what you do is in mm-hmm. Great Britain mm-hmm. at the moment. I think all of it is in Great Britain. Great Britain, and we have an initial pipeline project. Um, uh, that we've disclosed in in, in Ireland, uh, okay, uh, one hundred eighty meg project. I don't, I don't need to say anything you haven't disclosed, or sure. I'm sure you no, guys. Are, I'm sure you guys are looking around around the world. So, what sure. what are you thinking about about international markets? Um, is that is that something that is important to Gresham House right now? Um, it, it's something we're always exploring. Um, one one of the great things about this sector is electricity is the same wherever you go. Um, if you put in a battery system, you're going to put in a similar battery system wherever you go. The analysis is different in terms of what the market is. Um, but ultimately, even the generation mix uh, will be a version of, of what you have in the UK. You know, It'll be renewables, gas, maybe coal, maybe nuclear, maybe hydro, but it, and in the different mixes and with, crucially, different weather patterns. Um, but all that does is, is alter the equation and the output um, in terms of what you might build. 
um, but ultimately you're still going to build a battery system with probably the same technology. Um, so um, that that does mean that uh, the industry's sort of um, well, our skills or our knowledge could be exported um, abroad, um, but we haven't made any commitments abroad beyond Ireland. What what strikes me is and. Um we're looking internationally in various different markets and we'll be in various different markets soon. That's all very exciting. But it's kind of, you, you learn the, the great British market uh, and you learn about frequency response and you know fast response and the balancing mechanism. And you think, oh, I've got to go and learn all these other markets again. Mm-hmm. But they're very similar. It's a bit like learning French when you speak English or, you know, it's, 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 there's, there's so much crossover. Actually, I don't speak great French. That's yeah, a really I was going to say, <laughs> we, should, example. we should do this in French. <laughs> I thought you were going to, oh, no, I think they'll start talking to me in French. Um, I could do that. No, um, yeah. But uh, th- that's a really bad example. What my point is, that you may have a different t- type of auction structure or different rules or a different settlement period thing. But actually, the, the general principles are the same. Uh, whether you're looking here, you, know, you need frequency response, you need a, merch- a deep merchant market, you need a deep balancing market eventually, um, you need access to these markets, and everything's moving towards real time. So as yep. long as you kind of get your head around that, the new markets aren't that complicated. That's what I've, I've thought, but maybe that's my arrogance. Coming, coming through here. I don't think it's arrogance. I think it's a good summary. Um, of course, there's devil in the detail. You know, yeah. of, um, not every market is a wholesale market structure, so that that supplies that, that sort of supplies certain markets. Um, and of course, there could be complexities at all the levels, whether it's at the development stage, interconnection, sort of before, you know, the pre um, commissioning stage. And, and there are complexities in those areas. But but again, they are all just shades of grey. I, I, the way I observe it for the time being is, is that every market has the same requirements. So you still have to worry about, you know, whether it's called a construction license or a planning permission or something yeah. else or, um, or interconnection or enduring connection or just a connection offer. Or it doesn't, it's just parlance and jargon. Um, so, but um, different regulations, laws, um, rules seem to be emphasized and applied differently depending on the country, but more as a function of history. Um, but ultimately, the, those rules will exist yeah. and exist for a good reason. And so um, I want to ask you one, one last question, and I'm going to come back to this end game point, right? So okay. what's the vision? So where does energy storage, you're deep in energy storage now, mm. right? Where does energy storage fit in the future energy system? Yeah. You know, how important is it? How much stuff is it doing? And, and what's the impact that it has on humanity? Bit of a big question. but Big question. Rather than taking the global view this time, they'll take the UK view. Yeah, we have we have um, best estimate off the top of my head is probably about thirty seven gigawatts of, of of average demand for power um, through the year. Huge variability intraday and seasonally, but you know if that's the level. But electricity represents twenty percent or so of total energy consumption. So that twenty percent is going to go to a hundred percent. It doesn't mean that we go up five times because electric cars are more efficient than petrol cars, much more. Uh, gas heating is much less efficient than heat pumps, which yeah. are at least twice as efficient. Um, so we, we might see electricity demand double or triple, though, um, especially with some economic growth. Um, and maybe we even onshore something, who knows, um, as opposed to having gone the other way for decades. Within, within that larger electricity um, pie, uh, we will see renewables become 80 to 100 percent of the total um, if we want to hit net zero. And we need to do that. Um, I think it's entirely possible based yeah. on um, the resource that we have, then especially offshore wind. Um, you'll need the energy storage, and you'll need two forms of energy storage. You need energy storage as we know it, which will cover a huge percentage of situations, and you'll need what's called long du- long duration energy storage, which might not end up being long duration energy storage. Um, it might end up being, um, you know, when, when we have a 500 hour under generation from wind fleet event, um, it might just be gas with sequestered yeah. CO2. And when we've got over generation. Interconnectors. I'm, I'm back in interconnectors, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I just, um, I've always, I've always scratched my head about interconnectors. Yeah. In m- many situations they might help, um, in, in other situations that they might just prove that they don't help as in, you know, if it's super sunny and windy and blustery or something across all of Europe. Everyone's wanting to export to everyone else. It doesn't really solve the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's that's my slightly um, tongue-in-cheek example. But I've been using that one for a while, all versions of it. And and same goes the other way around. You know, if it's, um, you know, surprisingly still winter's evening, you've got no solar, you've got you know, no wind. 
and all of Europe will be stuck with Does this it matter when you can get capacity market um, contracts in both ends of your interconnector? Well, that's, d- <laughs> well, that's a, that, that's a <laughs> yeah. commercial okay. question, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that, that speaks to... Um, Sorry, you know, do, one do, out there, do you care so about that. solving the problem, or do you care yeah. about making money? <laughs> and I think we need to focus on achieving both. Yeah. Um, no, I, th- I think you end up with... Um, the the uh, shortfalls in generation over long duration events, which doesn't really apply to what we're doing, except in certain circumstances, being being achieved. Well, the only technology I know of today would be a gas engine, which is dispatchable and can be flexible from a zero set point, give or take. Um, while um, or when you're oversupplying, well, maybe we end up uh, onshoring some energy intensive industries. Um, I've never thought about this before. So instead of doing long duration energy storage, we have lots of short ish duration energy storage. And then when we have the really sort of almost black swanny event that we're mm-hmm. talking about, mm-hmm. we just run gas and make it really efficient gas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're okay with that. That's a, I've, I've never considered that before. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm just, th- this, is, this is goes to the core of, of how about you think about, think about these things. It's like, don't plug in a technology that doesn't exist yet because it might never come along. Um, and I don't know of a single technology that does solve it. Even an interseasonal battery you know, have a self, has a self-discharge rate that makes it relatively ineffective if, if the, the, the oversupply event comes in the early part of the year and then the um, undersupply event comes later in the year when you need it, you've already self-discharged because batteries self-discharge. And of course, you can keep them topped up, but that, that in effect speaks to ineffective. It's like evaporation yeah. it's, uh, yeah. in, in a pump, pump hydro. Exactly yeah. right. Exactly. Very good exa- example. And I haven't thought of that. Um, <laughs> well, I'll, swap. I'll use yours. Swap. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like that. Um, so... So essentially, I think those are sort of three underpinnings in the future, yeah. in whatever mix in, within the renewables uh, and in whatever mix we end up seeing within the, 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 the key quote-unquote storage segments, because actually one of them might just be uh, more gas, with, with uh, which is decarbonized. But it's big, right? The numbers you're talking about there are two or yeah. three times peak, Absolutely two or three huge. times average load now. So that's yeah. like almost triple, almost 100 gigs yeah. of energy, of electricity yeah. and mass electrification. Yeah. And we're going to get there with mostly renewables. So let's say yeah. that's, let's say... I don't know, above 50 gigawatts, but it could be 75, 80, right? Of, of additional, gig, of, no, re- of nameplate capacity, I, I would have thought it was another 100. Yeah, yeah. yeah. because you, uh, there's because a load the factor. factor yeah. And then so, um, yeah, and then you need a load of batteries. So we're talking, we've got a long way to go. We yes. could be doing one of these in 10 years' time and still talking. And, and, we uh, could. Figuring out what, what, what on earth were we talking about 10 years let's, ago? Let's agree to let's do, do that. that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's probably a good time to wrap up, Ben. I just want to say Fantastic thank you question. so much for coming on and taking time out of your day. Um, I'm sure everybody listening absolutely loved that conversation. If you've got comments, please do let us know in the comments or uh, remember to subscribe on Spotify or whatever, wherever you're listening. And until next time, um, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.